Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and oftentimes we start with the carnivore cures meat only elimination diet. Today I'm very excited to have my friend Mary Fields back on the channel. She came on about two years ago and she was 78 and now she is, I think when this video comes out, she will be turning 80. So this is a celebratory interview and it's also an interview that many, many, many people have requested. So I hope that this interview shares how you can do carnivore as you age, if that even matters and what carnivore means to Mary and how much she's healed and what else she needed to do in order to get to better health. There's a lot of heartfelt conversations in this interview. And I hope that you can take away a lot of things. If you haven't checked out the first episode, it will be in the show notes. You want to check that out as so many people fell in love with Mary during that time. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Mary. It's so wonderful to have you join me again today. For the people that are listening and watching, I've interviewed with Mary Fields. I think it's been almost two years now. So I will put our initial interview in the show notes, but you definitely want to check it out. It is a conversation that so many people have just really felt connected with you, Mary. And just, I know a lot of people wanted an interview update with you just to see how you're doing. So for the people that have not watched the first episode, if you can just share a little bit about you and, you know, what started you on the carnivore journey? Okay. Well, I started on the carnivore journey in, let's see, February of 2020, February 2nd, 2020. And it was after a lifetime of many efforts to lose weight, to improve my health. I've done every diet at least once, even the grapefruit diet. Did you ever hear the grapefruit diet? (laughs) No, I don't think so. Grapefruit and I think hard boiled eggs. That was a long time ago. So yeah, I, um, I did everything. And I did see, I had a lot of health issues, uh, really serious. I had systemic candida, I had IBS, I had chronic fatigue syndrome, I had raging eczema, um, I had clinical depression, a lot of things like that. And a lot of that, uh, some of that cleared up during my efforts. I, I went vegetarian, then I did vegan, then I went back to being vegetarian, then I went paleo. And, uh, but as I got older, I developed uncontrolled hypertension. So my blood pressure averaged 169 over hundred. And then it went up from there. That was my low point all the time. And I would just take my blood pressure and get mad and not take it again for a while. I didn't really even at the time understand how high that really was or the significance of it. And uh, I developed AFib and arrhythmia. I ended up in ER twice with that. The second time I was admitted to the hospital overnight, basically they felt like I was a really healthy person, even though I was still having a lot of health issues. And I saw a cardiologist, you know, they, they talked about putting me on blood thinners and stuff, which I never did. And when I got out of the hospital the second time, by that time I had found out about a carnivore. My daughter told me about it. And I thought it was the most insane thing I'd ever heard of in my life. I was shocked. I gasped. I said, that is very dangerous. And, you know, meat causes cancer. I just went off, you know, on everything I knew. I'd been studying nutrition for about 30 years on my own. And I was like, no. But when I got out of the hospital, I thought, you know what? I've tried everything else. I'm 77 uh, years old. I might as well try this because I've now developed a situation with my heart. So I did. I went home. I called a friend of mine and I cleaned out my freezer and my pantry, gave her everything found a local rancher, went down to see him and bought meat and started eating it. And I was just shocked. I I was like, my body was so malnourished. And I just, I couldn't, I, all I wanted for the first three months was the red meat. So I did that for about three months. I felt terrible. I had terrible diarrhea. I was tired all the time, but the eczema went away very, really I would say within three months, I no longer had eczema. 
my blood pressure went down almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And within a few weeks, I was off of all the blood pressure medications. So I could see that I was making progress. And so I just kept doing it. And honestly, it's been almost three years now. I feel great all the time, which is amazing. My goal was to go into my 80th birthday, which will be in December next, next a month from tomorrow, was to go in strong and really healthy. And I have achieved that. Everything that I wanted to achieve on carnivore, I have achieved. So all of the, the hypoglycemia, the hypertension, the AFib, the arrhythmia, the eczema, the depression, I mean, everything ha is gone. All the symptoms are gone, even the allergies. Uh, I had really, really bad pollen allergies. Those are down to just a bare minimum now with no medications. I was on three meds for allergies, even during carnivore. So I've achieved every, all the goals that, that I set for myself. And I, I feel really good. It's wonderful to sleep well at night, wake up in the morning, feel like getting up, have energy and be able to be really active every day. I had a really rough time starting in, I think it was April after we had our interview mm -hmm. in February. I've had COVID three times. So I, in a period of a year, I had COVID three times wow. and it was really rough. And I, I started presenting with long haul COVID and of course, when I did all the research, I found out that nobody really knew what to do for it. So that was discouraging. And during that period of time, I never really recovered fully from the first bout of COVID, which was the worst one. It was really rough. Uh, it never went down in my lungs, but I, it hit my joints really hard and then my muscles and just this chronic fatigue. I was just tired all the time. So I got and I started having problems with depression during that time, which I understand is typically what happens with COVID. That's one of the symptoms of long haul too. But you know what? I pulled out of all of that. And it's the last bout I had was in April of this year. And what really turned the corner for me was when I started the gut protocol that you recommended. I felt amazing just almost immediately after I started it. And I was able to do it for two months. I had to stop at that point because the supplements are phenomenal, but they are all plant-based and they have a lot of things in them that are triggers for me. And I noticed I started feeling like I used to whenever I had really high blood pressure. I had stopped taking my blood pressure. My blood pressure machine finally wore out. And I just never got a new one. So I got a blood pressure machine and took my blood pressure. And guess what? 169 over 100. I got off of the, the protocol and then started doing all the things I knew to do to get my blood pressure normalized again. And it, it took about six weeks before it finally just totally stabilized. But that's when everything changed. And about three months, I guess a couple, couple of months ago, maybe, maybe three months ago, I just got up one morning and I, I felt different. I was like, huh, something happened. Something's happened. I don't know what it is, but it's really good. And it's it's just been great ever since. It's like I turned a corner. And, you know, we've been in communication during that time. And so I've seen the ups and downs and you've always sort of made it through. And, um, and so I commend you for even sharing that story. There are people, and we'll talk about gut health in a second, but there are people in the carnivore community that still cannot regulate their blood pressure. Not to say that, you know, all the science, but what do you think may be causing some people on a carnivore diet that's been pretty much mostly meat based, maybe only meat, but the blood pressure is not going down enough. Do you have any thoughts of why that might be occurring? Yeah. I mean, I don't have any science. I'm not a doctor. I'm not advising okay. anybody. <laughs> I, I don't have the science, but I'm just telling you what happened for me. So the supplements, let me back up. For me, the thing that drives my blood pressure are my adrenals. Mm. So, okay. and that's why the plant-based supplements uh, triggered the whole episode Cortisol. with high blood pressure because, and that's why I had so much energy, which I have a lot of energy. I have the same amount of energy now that I had then. I'm just not doing the supplements anymore. So my adrenals drive my blood pressure. And that is not just a food-based issue. That can happen with stress. For example, I went to the dentist about six weeks ago, maybe a little longer. 
And uh, I would went in to have an extraction of a tooth. That's, there's nothing really wrong with the tooth except that it's old. And we just thought it would be better to go ahead and, and extract it. And he had to take my blood pressure prior to the extraction. And it was 211 over 118. Now, guess what? <laughs> that had nothing to do with my diet. That was sheer hysteria <laughs> because I have white coat syndrome. Same thing happens when I go to the, now it doesn't, it, it's worse at the dentist than it is at the doctor. <laughs> so of course we could not do the extraction. And I went home and did all the things that I knew to do. And within a matter of about two hours, my blood pressure had stabilized. It was back down to normal. So in a crisis like that, what I do is take uh, L-theanine, Okay. which is a green tea extract. It's a very safe supplement and it will calm you down. And if uh, I take it sometimes at night because it will help me go to sleep. It you can't stay asleep on it, but it will help you relax enough to go to sleep. Yeah. So I took L-theanine. I took CBD oil. I take hemp oil. I still take that every night. So I took that. I think I took about maybe two or 300 milligrams of vitamin B3 niacin. Okay. And that's really the star of the whole supplement protocol for blood pressure for me, because B3 is a vasodilator. So when I take the B3, my blood pressure goes down really quickly. Now, when it's way up like that, and I'm in fight or flight, I have to do all of it. I have to do the whole protocol in order to get it to come down. So after I got home and took the supplements, I would say within two hours, it started dropping. It was like dropped to 150 over 90. And then I was taking my blood pressure about every hour. And within a few hours, my blood pressure was back down to about 120 over 70. But I repeated that protocol in four hour intervals. So I took it when I got home, then four hours later, I did it again. And then I did it again at bedtime. And by the next day, I, I wasn't needing to do any of that other than the B3. And of course, in addition to that, potassium and magnesium will lower your blood pressure. So my blood pressure tends to go up in the afternoon and evenings. So I'm still on the B3. I take about four or 500 milligrams a day and I do it in 100 milligram doses. So I'll start at two o'clock and take 100 milligrams and then at six, I take another 100 milligrams. Then when I eat dinner, which is around 8.30, I take another uh, 100 milligrams and then another at bedtime. And then if I wake up at night to go to the bathroom, I'll take one. And that has that's all I do now. I don't have to do the CBD oil or the l or anything during the day, but I am still doing that. I like the B3 too, because B3 is also, and it's just like an anti-anxiety meta. It's not a medicine, but it does help with anxiety. It also just helps you to relax. So, uh, and it's great for pain. Now it's just not going to work like an ibuprofen, but because it is a vasodilator, it will help with pain. So uh, those are just additional benefits that you can get from B3 in addition to getting your blood pressure down. And they're all safe. I wouldn't recommend taking, like I think with Dr. Brownstein, although it might not have been him, so we won't say it was him, but somewhere I read that you could take up to 1500 milligrams a day, which I, I would not recommend. I, you know, I would stay within a range of 500 milligrams. And I, for me, it's more effective to take it in increments like I do, rather than just taking a 500 milligram dose. I don't know. There, there's upper limits for vitamins and minerals. And I don't recall there being an upper limit for toxicity from the NIH or the um, dietetics association. So it might be okay to do the upper end. But like you said, it's probably smarter. I mean, with all my clients, I always start with a small dose to see, are you even able to tolerate this supplement? And then from there, you can go up. But I know people do that also with vitamin B1 or thiamine just for cellular function, autonomic nervous system support, and even um, I think it's metabolism of carbohydrates. So people will start with a very small dose of it, maybe 100 milligrams. And that's still above the recommended daily value, but people will go up even above 1000. And that's very much above the amount. But you know, for some people, certain supplements work better. And that's just the key is, it's finding what works for you. And that's always a little bit more difficult. I'm really glad you found that balance. Is there anything lifestyle or mindset that you also do when your blood pressure starts going up? Definitely walking. Okay. 
So one thing that can throw me off, uh, especially in the winter, is if I'm not out walking every day. I mean, that that alone can make a huge difference. Why do you think that? that? Go for a walk, you know, and I'm not, it's not about, you know, trying to do power walking or nothing like that. Just get outside and go for a a night, you know, a brisk walk if you can. And if not, just go, go outside and go for a walk. And the other thing is hydration. And that's especially true. I think for those of us who are older, we just have to be careful about staying hydrated. So it's important to make sure you're getting enough water. I don't believe in drinking too much water, but that, you know, those are all very subjective ways of measuring water. I drink about 60 ounces a day. I kind of monitor my, my fluids and um, I drink about 60 to 70 ounces of water a day. And that seems to work really well for me. It does make a difference. If your blood pressure is up, just drinking a glass of water sometime can help. Right, right. I had Dr. Richard Johnson on who's a nephrologist. He's a specialist in kidney function. And then he looks into blood pressure and all the mechanisms that affect blood pressure. So some of it he says is that we are metabolically unwell, or there might be some insulin resistance, which then causes the kidneys to start not balancing certain hormones, such as vasopressin. And so oftentimes it's not that salt is an issue, but it's just the balance of salt with water. So sometimes it's just having to drink more water, as you said, in the nutrition space or the wellness space, there's often this recommendation of half of your body weight in ounces. So if I weigh hundred pounds, I should be drinking 50 ounces. I know that's not entirely true for everyone, especially if you have a lot of weight on you, that's a lot of water. So then I see in the space, um, especially in the carnivore space that you should drink to thirst. The problem that I found is that when we drink to thirst, oftentimes, once we're finally thirsty, it's actually a sign of very severe dehydration versus when you're mildly dehydrated. And the problem I see in carnivore is that most people when we're eating, and I always use the Chinese food, but when we think of like Panda Express or Chinese food that has a lot of MSG and salt and sugar, we notice we're super thirsty, and then we end up drinking a lot of water. And so we're constantly hydrated because the trigger of the salt, sweet fat makes it triggering. When you're eating only meat and you're in a ketogenic state, you're not thirsty that often. And so I notice a lot of people end up not drinking enough. And then we'll do functional tests within our, in our clientele. And we notice that most people are are under drinking water. I agree with you. I think everyone should be really careful. If you drink, like if, if I drink this whole cup of water and I downed it, that's a harsh tax on your kidneys and it's not ideal. But I do also think there are a lot of risks with carnivores becoming dehydrated because we are just not drinking enough water. Well, I get really thirsty because okay. I do a lot of salt. I do this sole water. Okay. And I just love salt. So I use sole water to, to season. Okay. Oh, and okay. Uh, my food is really salty and I like it like that. So I get thirsty, especially in the, especially like if I've had a steak, there's something about the steak that makes me really thirsty. Uh, not so much with like chicken or, or be, you know, just a ground meat patty or something like that, but I do get thirsty. Okay. And I, I got concerned. I thought, gosh, I hope I'm not diabetic or something, <laughs> but I, I figured out that it's the salt mm-hmm. because I do a, a lot of salt. I don't know if people could tolerate as much salt as I eat, but I really like salt. Yeah. And- it's the only seasoning I use. So right. Right. I've, I've, I've acquired quite a taste for it. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Richard Johnson says that if you have a lot of salt and you notice your, it's really like the density of sodium within your body, then you just need to drink water and that'll be that fine balance. So it's not a concern about salt itself. It's really how much water are you drinking with that salt? But yeah, I think your simple solve, as you said, is just drinking a little bit more water. I know there are people that are, when they become dehydrated, they can also have a cardiovascular event as well. And so that's where I am actually a fan of drinking sufficient water. And I, I agree with you. I think it depends on the person. So I don't always follow the half, the body weight. I think if anything, I try to say half your ideal body weight. So if you go by those BMI numbers, I know it's not super accurate, but go by the lower BMI range. And if you use your height for that, and then at least try to drink half of the ounces in water that way, then you're probably in a safe zone of hydration. 
And that's sort of how I play it for my clients. But moving on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your gut health. So what do you think triggered? Because you you didn't need gut supports for the two, three years you were a carnivore. And then COVID hit. I know you were you ran into a little bit of a bump. And then we tried the gut supports and it worked for a while as it needed. And then you got off him, which is the right thing to do. What do you think happened that triggered you to all of a sudden need these gut supports? Well, uh, I think part of it was stress. I mean, I, I, I really want to kind of park there for a minute because okay. this is something I'm becoming more and more aware of is that when I get stressed out, it goes right to my gut. And usually I'll end up having loose stools and a stomach ache. And I used to always associate everything with food, but I'm finding out that's not true. Yeah. So when I started carnivore and right up to the gut protocol, I was taking probiotics and digestive enzymes. And uh, of course, the digestive enzyme I was taking, I stopped taking because I started taking the one that you recommend, which is a phenomenal digestive enzyme. That is awesome. It's really good. But um, when I got off of the protocol, I went back to my digestive enzymes and I started having a lot of diarrhea and stomach cramps. And I thought, I wonder if it's the digestive enzyme. So I quit taking it and it all went away. Really? So I don't have any digestive problems now. I mean, no, I still take um, the HCL and I still take ox bile, okay. but I don't take a digestive enzyme anymore. And I have no bloating, no loose stools, no, no, none of that. It's all gone unless I get stressed. <laughs> So, and if I get stressed out, it's just like my blood pressure goes up and my stomach goes crazy. So uh, I guess, you know, to kind of go back to what we were talking about, another thing that's really important about managing your gut, your your blood pressure, whatever it is that's triggered through stress is it's really important to address. This is how I do it. I address what I'm stressed out about. Why is that stressing me out? And what do I de- need to do to change that? Now, I don't, I don't watch a lot of news and I don't watch the, tr- tr- you know, the typical news programs, but I do follow certain things. And I've had, I had a night about two weeks ago when I was up until three in the morning, working through what I had just heard. I was not in good shape. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things I have to monitor. I have to discipline myself to understand that I don't have control over everything and to recognize the things that I can't control and just fall back on my faith, knowing that I am to trust God and that, that it's all going to work out. So that's, that's one of the big triggers for me. Another thing is, and this is, I don't know how deep I want to go into this because some of it's kind of personal, but sure. I've just in the, I would say in the last several weeks have revisited many things about my growing up years. And I grew up in a very, very stressful environment, constantly, constant fear. I did not know what it meant to be safe. And I did not know what it meant to be loved. So now we look like the ideal family to everybody who was on the outside looking on. We look like the model family, but people had no idea what was going on behind closed doors in our home. So you would think after 79, almost 80 years, <laughs> I would have worked through all, I've been to counseling. I had nine years of Christian counseling years ago. I've read so many books and I've really worked on overcoming and healing. And I feel like that the Lord has really done amazing things in my life to heal me and, and bring me into the fullness of who I am. But there's, you know, I guess when you're getting older, it doesn't go away. So in other words, it's like peeling an onion and you just keep going down, you know, one layer after another. And so some of those things, it's like some little thing can trigger something that it's like a root from way back in my past. And I've had a couple of incidences like that recently. Now, the good news about it is that through that, I really got free. Like, for example, here's a good example of one of the things that I was constantly stressed out about was my appearance. Because I grew up being told that I was fat. And the message was always, you're fat and therefore you are not lovable. And 
uh, of course, never mind that my dad was morbidly obese, but this was just what I was told constantly. You're fat, you're ugly, and you're stupid. But mostly it's because you're fat. Well, I wasn't even fat. If you go back and look at me as a child growing up, I was not fat. Now, I wasn't a beanpole like my two sisters, but I just went to prayer and I said, Lord, I've got to get free from this. I'm 79 years old. I mean, enough already. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had an incident happen in my life right after that, that was tied to a relationship that I realized was codependent. And I didn't even know I was still in any, any form of codependency because I was very codependent when I, that's what we had a very codependent household, mm. very dysfunctional. But through that, uh, I just was having a conversation with this person and it just all, it was like my eyes were open and something was said and it's something just snapped in me. I could, I heard it and I knew I had gotten free from something. I just didn't know what it was. And then after I got off of the conversation and had time to come home and just think about it and pray about it, I realized this was the root of all of my frustration and my fears and my anxiety about being fat. And honestly, Judy, I looked at myself in the mirror and for the first time I saw myself the way I really am. And I thought, you're not fat. <laughs> you're not even close. <laughs> and I just got free. I, I can't even explain to you how different it's been for me since that happened. It's, it has absolutely been awesome. And that was a big stressor for me. And it was so much a part of my life. I was kind of aware of it in a way, but you know how you just live with something. It's like your modus operandi. And that is totally gone out of my life. And it has been a real game changer. I think what you just shared is something that a lot of people struggle with. First, thank you so much for being honest. I mean, I think we all want to say, I'm healed and now I'm healed forever. But there are certain things that we still struggle with even at the age of 79. And when you share about that, the image of you or that you perceive yourself as being overweight, I mean, that's a very real tangible thing that most people struggle with. So what is something that people can do? I mean, you had something that triggered a conversation that helped you, I guess, get over the trauma that has happened in the past that has constantly brought this forth in your life. So what can people do, you think, from maybe your own experience that people can let go of trauma? And I, I truly agree. There's so much of our pain is stored in our body. It's like we've talked about offline. The body keeps the score. So you can put all your past troubles and traumas under a rug, but your body doesn't forget. So maybe it'll manifest as illness in the body. Maybe you'll never get your blood pressure down. Maybe you'll always have gut dysbiosis. But as you said, I mean, when our adrenals release things because it perceives we're in stress or it remembers all the things we put under the carpet and we feel like it's a similar situation, we don't realize why we're reacting, but it's because we haven't dealt with everything, but somehow you've been able to confront that and let go. Are there some things that you might recommend to the people watching and listening that can help them even start? pursuing the things that are maybe under the carpet or, you know, the trauma that they've experienced that have really altered their life's trajectory? Sure. This has been the most effective for me. And I applied this because, okay, I had the conversation. I heard the snap. I got free, but you have to learn how to live in that freedom, when, that especially means? when it's been a lifelong pattern, because it's, it, it's going to try to come back and this, it's a familiar place. Sure where I had lived all my life. And so this is a technique I use. It's been very effective. It can be done different ways for different people. I'm a Christian. I read the Bible. So I use scriptures. Okay. So I said to the Lord, I need a scripture so that every time I'm tempted to think about my body. Okay. So here's the way it would work for me. I would be rehearsing to myself things that I might say that would explain why, you know, I wasn't a size six instead of a size 12, which frankly, a size 12 is a great size for me. That's about right for me. I have big bones, I'm tall, etc. cetera. But uh, it doesn't matter. That's the right size for me. So, uh, and I would just rehearse this every day and look at myself in the mirror and make a decision. Am I fat or am I skinny? These are things I did regularly. It was like an obsession. Right. So I said to the Lord, what was the scripture I could stand on? 
so that every time that thought comes, I rehearse the scripture out loud. So for me, it was Romans 12, 1. I present my body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because this is my spiritual worship or my reasonable service. And I'm not conformed to this world. So every time I would say that, I remember the world, there's a there's a whole world view out there about fat and skinny. Right. It's a multi-billion dollar business. So I'm not conformed to this world, but I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I can prove what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Well, the time I got through saying all that out loud, I totally forgotten whatever I was thinking about with my body. And you just keep for the viewers. If you're not a Christian, uh, you can find some other way. Even if you are a Christian and you don't want to use scripture, you can write down a positive confession about yourself. And then every time you're tempted to start meditating on that old way of thinking, which drives the whole stress uh, lever then you just stop and out, if you're in a place where you can, you just say it out loud to yourself. And at first, you may have to do that many times a day. If you're at work, you can excuse yourself and go into the ladies room and do it or the men's room or find a place. But that has been the most effective thing because there is a saying that what you think or what you meditate on becomes what you do. And what you do, become, it, it actually develops your character. And your character is going to determine your destiny. So you have to start with your thought life and change the way you're thinking and the way you're seeing yourself. And through that, it will begin to change your whole trajectory. So your whole direction, you're going to go in a whole nother direction from that. And I have used that for many, many things. And I still do. I'm laying in bed at night and I have a hard time going to sleep. I just start quoting scriptures to myself, I can go to sleep like that. And that's powerful. So if you think about, and I guess it's because I still have younger children, but oftentimes when a child is crying under the age of three, there's a lot of conversations about just redirecting, right? So instead of saying the reason why you can't have that and it's trying to justify why a child can't have it. I mean, of course there's moments that they might need that, but ultimately just changing their perspective. So instead of focusing on the toy or whatever they can't have, look at something else and immediately the child will forget. And I think that tool is similar to what you're bringing up. It's, it's redirecting our thoughts. So our comfort patterns, our neuro neuro pathways may be used to thinking when I see myself in the mirror, I automatically think that I'm not a size zero, a size six, and then I'm going to think automatically that I'm fat and having these constant pathways just lit up. It's our natural thoughts to have without even um, being aware that they're happening. But every time we then become aware of these thoughts, and then as soon as we have them, and we know that they're not ideal for us, then if we say no, instead of having that thought that I'm fat, then I'm going to redirect my thoughts into some other way. And that proves to be so effective, as you said, because it'll change our what is our natural inclination and our mode of operandi, as you said, of how we'll function when we see things when we view things of the world. And eventually, it's hard to change, but it's absolutely possible. And um, it reminds me of this book. So there's a book called, I think it's the complaint free world. And what they talk about is you wear a wristband in one arm or one hand, and it could be about anything. It could be about complaining. It could be about negative thinking. It could be about anytime you bring up a negative thought about your appearance, whatever thing you're working on. And every time you have this negative thought, you switch it. And I did it for just a week. And I'm like, I'm going to have a day of no complaining. And it is so difficult, so difficult, but it makes you aware and very hyper aware that you think that, and then it, then how can that not then impact your world and the way you're viewing the world? If all I do is, oh, it's cold. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, um, I, I need this. And all I'm saying is complaining. Well, imagine the world I'm creating around me. It's just filled with negatives instead of seeing the beauty that um, is right around me. And so once I started doing that, I noticed one, I have to force myself to stop complaining. It naturally will start making you think of other things that you used to fill with complaints. Yes. Our words are so powerful. I mean, I think it's important for people to develop their spiritual life. Oh, I agree. I really do. And, you know, I mean, for people who are not Christians, there are other ways that you can do that, but it's really important. That's a very important attribute. It's it's important part of our life. We can't ignore the whole spiritual side of our life. So, uh, and I, and it really ties into dealing with stress. The nutrition with Judy brand is working on a mind, body, spirit support. And 
when you look into the limbic system, that's where it's a part of our brain that controls our emotions, our memories, but it also controls the fight or flight. And in that area, if you keep using the lever that causes you to be stressful, eventually you'll always be in this stress state, this fight or flight state. And the thing about the fight or flight state is it pulls all your blood from your gut, from um, your limbs to just focus on running away from your the animal. And so your immune system then drops because the body's thinking, I need to prioritize you to have the most energy to run from your predator instead of then being able to digest well, because the opposite of then is digestion and improving gut health and also for healing and immune function. And then it also takes away from the ability to feel connected, right? Because when you're in a fight or flight state, the last thing you want is to feel connection and community. Instead, you want to feel isolated and you start feeling depressed. And over time, if you'll eventually get so isolated and depressed, and it just becomes this, you know, continuous downhill effect. Whereas if you have a spiritual being of just life is more than just about me, there's hope in ways that even science can explain that I can heal from and believing that there's things bigger than us and greater than us. I think it gives people hope and that belief and hope then can affect your actions as we've just talked about. Absolutely. Hope is very important. The Bible says that hope will not disappoint us, that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance produces character and character produces hope, which will not disappoint us because the Holy Spirit has been shed abroad in our hearts. So hope is very important, especially right now in the times that we are living in. We have to keep our hope alive because uh, it's legitimate. It's not, you know, uh, hoping is different from wishing. Hoping is like it's an expected positive end. So you know where you are, but you realize that this is going to end up on a positive note. And yes, that is very important for us to have a good attitude and for us to learn to love ourselves, And especially as women, because we are under so much pressure from our culture to look a certain way. And we have been led to believe that if we don't fit that criteria of looking that way, if we're not skinny enough, if our makeup isn't right, if we we don't have the latest fashion, whatever it is, that somehow we're not going to be acceptable and we're not going to be lovable. Okay. And we have to come to a place in our life where we can go deeper than that and really get into relationship with ourself. So one of the things that happened for me with the snap was that the battle, the frustration that I had had all of my life about my body was gone. And for the first time in my life, I have peace with my body. And it has made a tremendous difference in my health, in my energy, in my ability to enjoy life. I mean, I've always been a positive person. I could always put a positive spin on things. I'm an encourager. So that's just what I naturally do, you know, with other people. But it has changed everything for me to have made peace with my body and to to know that there's more to me than just my appearance, a lot more to me. Now I knew that intellectually, (laughs) but to have gotten free from the bondage that I had myself under for most of my life has taken that to a whole nother level. That is truly wonderful. Yeah. They say that we should all treat ourselves and think of ourselves the way that we treat our best friends. And oftentimes we are our own worst critic. And I mean, I think, it's when I was struggling with my eating disorder, I would never go out unless I felt that I looked my best or I felt my best. And otherwise then I would use my eating disorder behaviors to justify why I can't go out because now I'm tired. Now I'm exhausted. And when I went through a whole exercise with my therapist, they asked me, why are you so afraid of going out? Even if you don't feel your best. And there was a slew of questions that she would ask and say, okay, pretend that was true. Pretend that your fear of going out and let's say you were not thin enough, then someone would make a comment of that you were fat. And then what is the fear behind that? And so she would ask why, 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 if everything was true. And ultimately it came down to, because then I wouldn't feel accepted, then I wouldn't be loved. And it took a long time for me to really process that to then understand I know ultimately that my worth is not measured by my outer appearance, even though a lot of times are all the external things are saying that it is, 
But I, I know that I have to remind myself and I have to do that redirection of when I would my best friend judge me because I gained a pound or two, or I don't look my best today. Would my best friend judge me and then not want to see me today? And normally the answer is no. And so that's what I have to rationalize in my mind to then be free from that as well. So I, I totally understand that. But I think for people that are listening and watching, it's the question of why are you so afraid if you were a little bit heavier or if you're not at a weight, what is it? Is it because then you don't feel worthy? Like what is the root cause of your belief in that? And I think it's such an important exercise to do. It is. It is. And I know a lot of people get into carnivore to lose weight, which I did. I mean, I started watching you, uh, your YouTube channel before I ever started carnivore. And it wasn't long after I had been doing it that I started realizing this really is not about weight loss. Right. This is about my health. And when my health has maximized, my I will be at the right weight. It might not be the weight, and it definitely is not. I mean, I weighed about maybe six weeks or so ago, and I had gained 14 pounds. The only reason I weighed is because I noticed my clothes, the 12s were getting tight. <laughs> I thought maybe I should just check my weight. And I gained 14 pounds, even though my size hadn't changed that much. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I did not get hysterical, but I thought, you know, maybe I should just see how many calories I'm eating. Maybe that has something to do with it. So sure enough, I was eating about 2,700 calories a day. And most of it was because of all the added fat, because the only thing I love more than meat is fat. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Same with me. Uh, So I just... Uh, I just did a really simple thing. I, I uh, figured out how many calories were in my servings. And I just started reducing my servings enough to get my calorie down to about 2000. Mm-hmm. That's about right. I think for me, I know it is because I feel really good at it. And um, I haven't weighed again, but the size 12s are fitting really nicely now. Mm-hmm. And I did take my measurements because I, I sew. I've started sewing again. I used to be a dressmaker and a tailor back in back in the day. And I started sewing again. I had to take my measurements. So I took my measurements again today. And my waist was an inch smaller and my hips were two inches smaller. So I'm getting smaller. But so what? That's kind of like, you know, as long as I'm not uncomfortable. Uh, but anyway, um, that's the other thing I wanted to say about the weight and the self-image and everything this has been my experience with carnivore is that I cannot go by how much I weigh because I've gone from a size 16 to a size 12 and my net weight loss has been about nine pounds. So I've gone down four sizes with very little weight loss. And at 80 years old, I have muscles for the first time in my life. I have muscles in my arms and I have a lot of muscle in my legs and in my butt because I walk And I learned to squeeze my butt when I walk because it keeps me from overusing my knees and my other joints. So I've got buns of steel. (laughs) I really do (laughs) at 80. And I have a muscle in my arm, which is amazing because normally by this time you've lost your muscle, right? right. You know, everything's just sagging. And even my sisters, we we had a sister retreat and they were, um, my younger sister said, your arms are not all floppy, you know, and and you have muscle. And I said, yeah, it's, it's the meat. So the scales, you can't really go by the scales. And if I was going to give somebody unsolicited advice, which (laughs) I'm going to take the opportunity to do that is get rid of the scales, right? Just get rid of them because they're not going to tell you what you, they may not. I know a lot of people have lost weight and all of that, but you know, the scales may not tell you what you, it certainly hasn't for me. I thought I would be back where I was when I was this size, I weighed almost 20 pounds less than I do now. Okay. When I was the same size I am now. Right. And muscle weighs a lot more than fat and other things. And I got to the point that I wanted um, size zero and being the thinnest, wearing the smallest size at a store. And I was the most unhappiest person I had. I hit all the superficial marks that I wanted to hit in, in my job, in, in finances and all these other things. And I remember thinking I am the most depressed and none of the things that I've been trying to materialistically acquire. And even in my physical body, 
did it make me be the happy person that if I only hit that, then I would be happy. And if anything, I th literally thought, wow, if I jumped off this 42nd floor, no one would know that I'd be dead for several days. And that was the thoughts that I had when I just wanted to achieve these things. And once I got there, I was nowhere near the happiness that I thought I would achieve. And that's the thing. I think we try to achieve these elusive things. If only I'm thinner, if only I'm perfect with carnivore, if only I do this, or if only I get this job, if only I move here, then my life will be better. And then, so we always wait every single day. And then that's how weeks and months and years pass. And we're still not happier because we don't think we've hit that perfection level, but that's not it. It's the day-to-day -day of what we do consistently. And just like you, um, I actually gained weight on carnivore, but I also have a lot more muscle mass. So there are parts of my body that did not exist prior to carnivore. And now I have a better body in, in some instances, but I'm heavier weight wise. And so I never get on there. And truthfully, it does trigger me. So I never weigh myself. And I just kind of go by how my clothes fit. But day to day, I just eat the meats that help me thrive. And I really think we should focus on the symptoms. If we have less symptoms, if you don't struggle with AFib, if you don't struggle with blood pressure, if you're not struggling with depression, if your mental health is good, then who cares what the weight scale, weight scale shows? Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's not, it's not even relevant. Right. And I think a lot of the obsession with weight is kind of like a red herring. Yes. So if you, if you just let, just focus on that. You don't really have to deal with the root cause of that because, you know, there's root cause for physical health, but there's also root cause for emotional and spiritual health. Yes. So, you know, I can remember when something that was really challenging for me to address came into my life, I would just go on a diet because I knew I could do the diet and I would be successful at it and that it would keep me my attention over there yes. instead of on what I really needed to be addressing. So it is important if, you know, if somebody's morbidly obese, yeah, they, it's a good thing to lose weight. That's a very good thing. But I didn't have that much weight to lose in the first place. I had about 30 pounds to lose. And uh, according to my assessment of you know, what I thought I should weigh and look like, if weights are real health issues, then yeah, carnivore is great. And, yeah. and you will lose weight. That's for sure. But it can't be the the main focus because there are many other things that contribute to our health besides what we're eating which we've talked about right and and the carnivore is an important part of that but it's not the only thing yes i'm sure people are going to wonder when you're talking about muscle mass and how you have your buns of steel how much you know you don't have to define exactly how much you eat because i don't think everyone just following your pattern of eating will have the same outcomes but typically, do you eat two meals a day, three meals a day? Do you eat a variety of meats? If you can share a little bit about what your eating day looks like. Yeah, I have a routine. I eat three times a day. That works for me. I'd love to be able to eat twice a day just because it's a lot of cooking and cleaning up the kitchen. <laughs> oh, and, but, and I don't tend to cook a lot of things ahead of time. So, you know, I cook every day and I clean the kitchen every day. But um, I, eat, I usually eat breakfast around 10 Okay. And I make my little meat medley that I've always made that has the ground beef and the lamb and the pork. Lately, I've kind of been off of the pork. I don't know. The ground pork just doesn't have a lot of flavor. I make broth. I save all my bones from all my meats that I, because everything I buy, I buy from a local rancher and everything I buy is bone in. You have more flavor when you have sure. the bone. And then I save the bones and I make broth and I use a little bit of the broth and I add the meat to it that's already been cooked put the Soleil water in there and oh my, it is really delicious. <laughs> and that's what I have for breakfast every day. And then um, at lunch, I may have chicken. I may have like today I had pork chops. I may have, a, occasionally I'll have a steak. I love roast and uh, I just get the, the lesser expensive cuts like the chuck roast, an arm roast. So I'll cook a roast beef and it'll last me maybe a day or two. And then in at night, I generally have eggs, eggs and bacon. I don't always have bacon, but I, I do have eggs. Sometimes I, I love um, pork rinds. I don't eat a lot at one time. I like the Epic brand because they're lighter. They don't have any, I don't like other seasonings. Right. So they just have the salt. They've been baked. 
And occasionally I'll maybe have some pork rinds with my uh, scrambled eggs or sometimes they're soft boiled, sometimes they're fried. I do them different ways. That's what I eat. Do you notice, because I know you mentioned that you ate beef or mostly ruminants in the very beginning, just the three months. Did you notice a difference in your overall health with eating a variety like you do versus just eating like beef or lamb? I've always eaten, well, the first three months I only ate red meat because that's all I wanted. Nothing else tasted good. Okay. But after that, I've always had a variety. I don't do real well on chicken. I like chicken, but it's really hard to find pastured chicken that's locally raised. And so a lot of times I have to go to Whole Foods and get chicken. Their chickens have been fed corn and soy. I mean, they're, they're the organic air chilled, whatever. But if I eat, especially with the white meat, if I eat a lot of white meat, I can start, I start having a mild allergic reaction to it. I might, you know, my eyes might get red and I sneeze a little bit and stuff like that. So, um, I eat chicken about once a week, sometimes a little more often. Lately, I've really liked white meat. I've never liked white meat before, but I have lately. Of course, I I cook everything in a cast iron skillet and I I never clean the skillet because you get all that good flavor. (laughs) And I kind of fry it, you know, in bacon grease and butter and it's really good. I think variety is really important, but it's not necessary. Sure. I watch people on on YouTube that are just ruminant meat and salt and water, and they're doing great and they like it. I just think it depends on what you like and what you're hungry for. And I like a variety. I love pork chops. I love bacon. Uh, I love lamb. I don't buy a lot of lamb because it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to eat the lesser expensive meat just for budgetary reasons. Sure. As a nutritional therapist, it's hard for me to just say ruminant meats long-term is ideal just from the different nutrient profiles of certain meats. I do think what you're doing is perfect. It's just when you feel like having white meat, you eat the white meat. When you want eggs cooked a certain way, you, we have to ultimately listen to our bodies. But when we first transition, maybe we need to eat just ruminant meat or red meats or certain meats that will help us to reduce autoimmune or inflammation or any of the other things that people come to this way of eating. But long-term, if people were to just eat beef, there are certain nutrients that are not in an abundance. And so for those reasons, and, and then just also seeing functional tests with nutrient profiles, I do see certain markers that are low or certain markers that are overly high. But generally, I think if people were to just get in tune with their body and start trusting their body more of what do I feel like eating today? And then just kind of go with that. And if that means it's red meat for months and months and months, maybe that is what you need. And, and that should be okay. I think it's just when people, so a lot of things I hear from my community or my clientele is I think I'm not healing on carnivore because I'm not eating just beef, salt, and water. So that's why, because occasionally I'll have a little bit of sweetener, or maybe it's because I'm eating some poofas from porks and chicken, or maybe because I'm eating fish. And I think it's really, no, maybe we need to also look at the emotional side, the, you know, the, the, all the other things we talked about, or maybe there's a other underlying illness, but I think that's, that's where my heartburn is with some of the carnivore is a community. It's when people think I'm just not perfect enough. And that's why carnivore isn't working for me. If I just ate beef or if I just ate lamb, then I would be perfect and fixed. And it's just, usually that's not the reason or the whole reason. No. And I think, you know, one of the things that's made carnivore successful for me is just keep it really simple and do what works for you. Because it's not going to be sustainable. You know, if if someone thinks that the only way they're going to heal is to never eat anything but ruminant meat, and maybe they're wanting something else, maybe they want some pork rinds. I mean, I love to get a thing of butter and get the pork rind and dip it in the butter and eat it. It's really good. You're making me want that now. (laughs) Yeah, you get the crunch, you get the, you know, you get the fat and all that. And it's great. Now, I used to eat a lot of that. I don't do that anymore. You know, I'll have a, a few and then quit and it's fine. I'm not, I don't feel deprived, Okay. but um, it's really important. I think to do what works for, for a person, because that's going to make it sustainable. And like, even though the chicken doesn't always totally agree with me or the eggs that I'm eating now, because I normally get pastured eggs from local farmers, but right now the hens are not laying it's cold and they're molting and they're not laying. So I have to get my eggs at Whole Foods. And again, they've been fed with grains, which 
uh, don't agree with me. So yeah, I have a little bit of a reaction, but you know, I'm not sick or anything. I'm not miserable. I'm not up at night with eczema or something like that. So I think it's important to do what works for each person and just go back to what we were talking about earlier, which our health is the, the nutritional aspect of our health is totally essential, but it's not the only thing that contributes to us, to our health, that there are other areas that we have to address. Absolutely. You, you started carnivore in your seventies. Do you think that you can achieve optimal health in your seventies or eighties? Like, what does that look like? Well, I think I'm getting really close. <laughs> so I would say yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, you know, in fact, I, I contacted several women that I've gotten to know through my last interview that I've kept in, in touch with. And uh, they're older. They're not as old as I am, but one lady is in her early seventies. Okay. Just, just to ask them if, are you still on carnivore and how's it working for you and all of that. And uh, they are, they're all still doing carnivore and their healing journeys are different from mine. So I didn't get results really quickly. It took time. I got some immediate results that were important enough to keep me on track and really there was nowhere else for me to go anyway. You know, carnivore was the end of the road. Sure. So I don't know what else I would have done. Maybe just never eat again, get an IV. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but I think everybody's health journey could be different. And I actually believed for a while. And again, this is, I have no scientific evidence for this. I'm just going on my personal experience and the women that I've stayed in touch with that are older and on carnivore. But in the beginning, I thought, well, it is different when you're older. You know, it just takes longer to heal. Right. Well, now I've talked to these women who are older and they heal faster than I did. One of them is kind of, is she's still more in her healing journey, but she's come a long way. Okay. And I think she's been carnivore about as long as I have. But so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't really think age has a lot to do with it. I think for me, because I had a long history of a lot of health issues and had been on a lot of different diets and done a lot of things to my body. It's just taken longer for me to heal. And I had all of the emotional healing that I needed to do as well that were, that was related to my body. So for me, uh, you know, I, I'll be three years in February and it's only been in the last couple of months that I've really felt like that I've achieved what I set out to achieve by making this lifestyle change. But that is not true for everybody who's older. So do, what do you think about aging and just healing in general? So you believe that most people, if they tried this way of eating can heal so much? I do. Okay. I think even, I mean, I was 77 when I started, I'm going to be 80 in December. So, uh, and I feel like I'm in remarkably good health for someone my age or even someone who's not my age. There are people <laughs> half my age that aren't as healthy as I am. So, you know, I'm, I'm healthy and I love it. So yeah, I think whatever age you are, I, our bodies are amazing. They really are. They're just an amazing piece of equipment. And I think if you start giving your body what it needs and you're consistent about it, that you are going to see results. One thing I would add to you, just because I know you, is other than carnivore, which obviously made a huge impact in your overall health. But as I know you as a person, just knowing a little bit about your hard journey, but also having this positive mindset, just the communications you and I have, you are a beacon of hope, even to me, you're a beacon of light. And I think that makes such a difference in your healing. So you don't think of it as, oh my gosh, I'm turning 80, I'm getting older, but this, oh my gosh, I'm turning 80 and I have so much health and I am so excited that I've achieved my goals. It's, you can tell just from the words you choose about your health and your journey, that it's part of the reason why you've healed so much. And I just want to let you know that because I see it whenever you email me, whenever we have our conversations, you are this ray of light. And you know, you've had your bumps where you needed to get on that gut protocol for just a bit, but there's still positivity in it all. And I just want people to understand that it wasn't just carnivore. I mean, carnivore does a lot. It moves the needle vastly, but there also needs to be the mindset of I can heal. I can heal even if I'm 70, even if I'm 80, even if I'm 90, 
or even if I'm twenties and I now have chronic illness, it's just the mindset is so important in healing and you have it and you've always had it. I think that's a reason why people loved you so much in our last interview is because you bring this ray of hope and light for people. Yay. (laughs) That's what I want. And I just want to say this also, because boy, I would like to put like 10 exclamation marks after this, that if you are in good health, your latter years are your best years. They really are. These are the best years of my life. I don't ever remember enjoying life like I do right now. And I love being 80. I'm going to finish really strong. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here, but while I'm here, it's going to be good. And that is possible for everybody. Oftentimes, especially in our culture, we have an attitude about older people. They're just kind of minimalized. And if you're in good health and you're going to be 80 like I am, I've lived 80 years. I've seen a lot. I've lived through several wars, all kinds of cultural changes, some really traumatic. The first half of my life was very traumatic. And yet here I am at 80 and life is really good. And so I just, I hope there will be older people who will watch this and can really get grasp this, that it is possible for these to be the best years of our life. I'm retired. It took me a while to adjust to that because I had always been a really hardworking person. And I, I had to learn how to throttle back slow down. If you wake up in the morning and you're not ready to get up, Mary, it's okay to go back to sleep (laughs) (laughs) and not being pushing myself all the time. But I've lived long enough now to learn some things. And one of them is how to enjoy life and to have a positive attitude about being older. And there's a whole scientific data about that. I read a book, I think it was called Cracking the Age Code something like that. I wish I could remember the name of it, but she talked a lot and she, it was, she did all the data collection and uh, all the scientific end of it. And one of the things she really stressed is how important it is for our attitude to change about being older, that getting older doesn't mean that you can just automatically expect to have health issues and for your, you know, your mind to slow down and et cetera. And she talked about the importance of social interaction and connection with people, connection with life. So kind of what I brought out of that as well, we retire from the workforce, but we don't retire from life. In many ways, life is beginning, you're beginning a whole nother phase of your life that can be very exciting. And, and it goes back to our, our attitude, what, you know, how we're processing this mentally. Because when you get older, you do, you really have to come to terms with the fact that you're going to die. If people are listening and they're older and they haven't addressed that, that would be a really important thing to address. Just to to settle that issue in your life that I'm coming to the end of my life now. And at some point I'm going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die or how I'm going to die, but I know I am. And then what am I going to do with the rest of my life? You know, it's easy to worry about your health. You know, you get a little pain here or a little pain there and think, oh my God, you know, (laughs) whereas when you were 20, it was, you don't even notice. So I think it's just, it's, these can be the best years of your life. They have been for me. My sisters are the same way. We've talked about that over and over. We've all been through so much healing uh, physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And we have, a we really are getting to be sisters. Like we didn't get to be when we were growing up and really enjoying each other and supporting one another and loving being older. And I just hope that if people don't get anything else out of this, that they can understand that getting older is not a bad thing. I see a lot of people doing surgeries or injections in their face to make themselves look younger. And I mean, I I think of it too, as I'm getting older of, is that what I need to do to stay on like social media and stuff? But I I think of, no, we should be embracing that we're getting older. And I've always, from a young age, I always loved talking to the older people and just hearing about life from them. And that was always so fascinating to me. And so I just don't know why our society is so focused on youth and being young and looking younger. And I get it. Hollywood makes everyone look younger and no one ever ages, but it's such a vanity metric and it doesn't mean 
that if we don't look well, then we're not worth listening to or looking at, if that makes sense. There's just a negative connotation to aging. There, you're right. And that's one of the things that was talked about a lot in the book that I read about how our culture is different in that way. Like cultures, older people are really exalted. I mean, you're yeah. admired and respected and it's a boast right. that you're older and uh, people look up to older people. And in our culture, we, we took the reverse on that. But just because we're older, we don't have to fall into that. You know, we can enjoy being older and enjoy our life and, and let people think whatever they're going to think. <laughs> That's one of the great things about being older. You're not under pressure anymore. <laughs> you know, the pressure is off and it's like, okay, that's how they feel. Fine. You know, I'm, I'm moving on now. Your 80th birthday is coming up. What are your plans and what are you looking forward to in this next decade of your life? My daughter and son-in-law are taking me to Anna Maria Island in Florida for two weeks. I love the beach. Oh, amazing. So we, um, and my, my granddaughter's coming because she's going to be 40. So she has her 40th birthday on November 27th. And I have my 80th on December 16th. So we're going to celebrate 40 and 80. (laughs) My daughter will be 60 in a year and a half. So we're, we're getting close to the 40, 60, 80. So we, we felt this was cause for a great celebration. (laughs) We like to celebrate anyway, but um, so we're going to go to Florida. Uh, We've rented a three story house on Anna Maria Island. It has a, 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 rooftop deck so we can go up there at night and watch the sun go down and we'll be able to be on the beach we're about 100 yards from the beach it's going to be wow. really fun so that's how we're going to celebrate do you plan on bringing your own meat are you sh- oh, um, yeah. okay well i'm not going to bring them i'm going to stick a couple of steaks in my suitcase <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> Are you really going to freeze them and then take them or are you? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah. I'll just take them out of the freezer and put them in my suitcase. It may totally make yeah. sense. And then I'll have them to cook when I get there because we, we like to do Airbnb so we can do all of our own cooking. Okay. Because we all, we're all pretty health conscious. They're not as much as like I am. They're not radical like I am, but <laughs> they, they eat healthy. So um, yeah, I'll just take a couple of steaks with me and then we'll, um, we'll go shop. Okay. We're going to, we're not that far from Sarasota. So we're probably going to Whole Foods to shop and, okay. and get our meat. Yeah. So, oh yeah, I'm wherever I go, the meat goes with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, and we do the same. So whenever we travel um, and go on vacation, we typically get a, a rented place and we no longer do hotels because my parents are meat-based. I am, my kids are, and my husband eats a heavy meat diet, but also adds carbs. So it gets very expensive if we were to just eat out all the time. It, oh, yeah way too expensive or I don't and- even like to eat out <laughs> I don't I mean I don't I haven't eaten at a restaurant yet where I got anything near as good as what I can cook at home I hear a lot of carnivores say that yeah <laughs> so is there any other tips and recommendations um things that you do on a daily basis that has really helped your healing journey anything you want to leave the community with as we close I think we pretty much covered it. The only thing we didn't talk about a lot was exercise. Oh, right. And I think that really is important. And especially when you're older and I'm not talking about some rigorous discipline where you have to go to the gym three days a week or something like that. But um, I've learned how to do like modified push-ups, modified okay. squats where I can hold on to something. And I just do those at the park. So I go to the park a lot to walk. Or I come over here where my daughter is because we like to go walk the dogs and we we're in East Tennessee. So it's very hilly. Get, you know, you can get a good workout with I don't walk more than a mile or so. Mm-hmm. I'd like to increase that a little bit, but I'm not pressuring myself. But just doing a few things that are not too strenuous, especially when you're older, because one thing I learned is when I started doing overdoing, then I would get an injury. And I'd have to recover from that and then start all over. So it's better to just start really slow and work up. But I think it's really important to get exercise every day of some kind. And it doesn't, you know, even if you just go walk around the block a few times. Yeah, I've even walked in the house some, you know, if there's days of really bad weather here, I'll just walk in the house. Sure. But I think that's, I think that's an important component too. 
I know people can lose weight and get muscles without exercising, but I feel like it's important to pump your lymphatic system yes, and to keep moving. Yeah. Especially when you're older. <laughs> no, I agree. I think there's people that are even in their twenties that don't move that much. So I agree. I think it's just not ideal to be sitting long-term and that's why I don't have as much time to walk as much as I'd like. And I love walking generally. So I'll just go to the gym for like 20 minutes because that's how I get some movement in me. Otherwise I'm sitting in front of a computer all day long. So that's the way I do it really quickly. Yeah. And if you are sitting in it, cause I did that whenever I was working and uh, what I would do is, is set the timer. And I got up from the computer every hour for about 10 minutes. And when I lived in Florida and the weather was uh, conducive to walking every day, then I would just get out and do like a five or six minute walk and come back in just to get up and to move around. Cause we're really not, we're not made to sit. Right. Right. I know. And my husband tells me that all the time. So when I get really hyper-focused in work and whether I'm writing a book or I'm doing something, I could sit for five, six hours straight. And he tells me that is so unhealthy. And I know that, but um, yeah. And so he tells me, he told, he told me that exact thing. He's like, you should put in a, an alarm reminder on you to get up and move around. I yeah. would, I would <laughs> urge you to do that because eventually it will catch up with you. I know. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. it. Or you can get a standing workstation. I know that's another thing you can do. So you're actually standing up while you're working, which is a lot better than, than sitting. But I know my daughter, for example, since they got the puppy, she has, she is very energetic. So she has to be walked about three times a day. And it, and she's just like you are. She's an entrepreneur. They've owned their own business for about 10 years now. And she can sit in front of the computer all day. But now that we have Elsa, she has <laughs> to get up and go walk Elsa. And it has made such a difference. Okay. It has really made a difference in the way she feels, how much better she sleeps and everything. So my oh. advice to you is, Judy, set your alarm. <laughs> I will. And I will. And I'll have to let hour, you know. do every hour and a half, but just take yourself away, yeah. walk around the house, go outside, do some, fold the clothes, you know, do something totally different that has you on your feet moving around. No, that's good. Thank you. I, I will yeah. definitely do that. And I'll, <laughs> I'll keep you posted because I definitely, yeah, I, I can sit for a very long time and it, it's my work tenacity, but it's not a good thing too. So I totally get it. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation as last time. And I always enjoy speaking with you, but where can people find you? I know you're not really on social media, but if you are at all, or if someone wants to contact you, is there a place? Uh, yeah, I'm going to give you my hotmail address. Okay. So if somebody wants to contact me, they can contact me through hotmail. Okay. So my hotmail address is Mary F is in Frank, Mary F 316 at hotmail.com. Okay. And I'll put that, I'll try to find that book. You talked about cracking the age code. Um, I want to read that as well. So I'll put that in the show notes as well. So I'll include all of that, your email and thank you so much and have a wonderful 80th birthday. That's a amazing milestone. Thank you. And it has been so much fun. I wish I could see you in person. <laughs> we will, we will definitely do it. We'll have to yeah, figure out a way. That. Yes. And it's <laughs> such an honor to be on your YouTube channel. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share my story. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing honestly and earnestly so much of your life and how it's not, there's ebbs and flows of life. And I just appreciate your candor and, you know, you have a infectious laugh. So I just, <laughs> I love having you on. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Judy. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this interview with Mary. It is a beautiful thing to start aging and get older and be wiser and all the benefits that come with being in this world for so many years. One thing is how to navigate things like the pandemic and what you've experienced in all the decades you've lived before. I really appreciate Mary because she's so honest and so candid with things that she still struggles with even at the near age of 80. But it shows you that we are always a work in progress and that healing can come even at the age of 80. We are always malleable and we're always able to do better and we should always have hope in our lives even if carnivore isn't working perfectly or certain things in your life aren't panning out the way that you expected it to that doesn't mean that it won't it just may be different or the path may be a little bit different i hope that you continue to have hope and know that 
carnivore can bring so much healing, but that doesn't mean that diet and nutrition will fix all the things in your life. Sometimes we need to pull other lovers such as spirit and mind and body balances and even exercise. A lot of times it's just the mindset. What is your point of view of being on a carnivore diet? Is it that I am sick? And so it's the only thing I can eat, or is it that I am blessed to be eating a variety of meats? Check your mindset and find things that Mary and I discussed to see if they're levers for you that you can use to get to ultimately root cause healing. I hope that this conversation provided you another lever to help you have optimal health. Happy birthday, Mary. I hope that many of you reach out to her and just wish her a wonderful, happy 80th birthday. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review. Thank you again. You know what to do. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.